What is a soul to you? That's a hard question. I would say, like theologically, a soul is that aspect of the human, that aspect of human being that's akin to divinity, that's made in the image of God. And so, and I, I think that that's a very, very important concept. I don't think a society can survive. I don't think that you can survive a relationship with yourself. I don't think you can have a relationship with another person. And I don't think a society can organize itself in a productive and sustainable and peaceful manner without that idea as the core idea. And so the core idea is that there's something of irreducible value that characterizes each human being and that it's of the highest value, which is what makes it say akin to God or akin to divinity. And so that's the soul. And then the question is maybe how does that manifest itself in the world? So what are its, what are its hallmarks? And I would say that that's, very tightly associated with what modern people describe as consciousness. And there's more to it than consciousness because it's also character. But I would say character is a manifestation of consciousness. What consciousness does, as far as I can tell, is confront unformed potential. And this is partly why I think it's improper. I'm writing a fair bit about this right now in my new book why it's improper to think of people as deterministic. You're deterministic once you've established a habit and you've practiced something for a very long period of time. You, you become more deterministic in your actions because you're expert at reacting. And there's neurological, neurophysiological circuits that are laid down to facilitate your action under those conditions and to run with some degree of automaticity. But most of the time, much of the time, what you confront is the changing future, the, 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 the future of potential, right? And it's, it's, like a, it's like a place of multiple pathways. And your consciousness is that part of you that confronts those multiple pathways and decides which one to walk down. And it does so according to its ethic. We talked earlier about the fact that you need a value hierarchy. It's inevitable that you have a value hierarchy and that you look at the world through it and that it should be well-structured and that there should be something of divine importance at the top. I would say what should occupy the top position is the realization, for example, that each person is of divine value and that the most appropriate way of interacting with potential is by embodying and speaking the truth. That's not a bad way of briefly conceptualizing what might be at the highest pinnacle of the value structure. I would say that's what the logos is. And so the soul is a, the soul is what manifests itself in the choice between different pathways, in, in the choice between different ways of transforming the potential of the future into the actuality of the present. And it does that by making ethical decisions, by choosing between good and evil at each choice point. And to the degree that it chooses good, then it takes the raw potential of the future and it transforms it into the being of the present that is good. And to the degree that it does that in a manner that's evil and contaminated by malevolence and hatred and vengefulness, then it takes a pathway that corrupts the world and makes things worse and it's the soul that's doing that and it's the soul that's responsible for that and it's also that active part of the soul that's shaping the deeper soul in some sense which would be something like the cumulative consequence of all those choices something akin to what people more classically have referred to as character now 
I don't know what to say really about the metaphysics of the soul, except that it's very mysterious that we have this capacity for consciousness, which is completely, um, I would say, beyond our current understanding. We have no good reductionist accounts of consciousness, except those put forward to deny the very existence of something like consciousness and free will. And the problem I have with those arguments is that, well, the first thing is that you don't look deterministic until you've built habit sets. And that's a consequence of consciousness because consciousness builds habit sets. And the second is that it doesn't seem to me possible to organize a relationship with yourself or an intimate partner or a family or a community without the concept of the divine value of the individual and the capacity of that divine spark, let's say, to manifest itself in free will. I don't see how societies can organize themselves without those principles. And to me, that indicates that there's something about them that's profoundly true. Now, you know, we all have our definitions of what constitutes sufficient proof for truth, but I think that's powerful. Those are, those are two powerful arguments. So the, it's hard to say what the soul means metaphysically because, you know, say beyond the cons beyond the confines of a single human being, we do have this sense that the soul can expand itself into something that's greater than, well, greater than it has been. It has this capacity for growth. And we do have this sense that the soul can expand itself to the point where it it's enlightened, for lack of a better word, that it's working as efficiently as possible to transform everything that's unnecessarily painful and malevolent about the world into what's positive and good. And, and, and that it does that as a consequence of confronting the world with courage and truth. And I, I think that's right. And I do think that that means that the soul participates in something eternal, which is the attempt of being itself to transform what's unnecessarily painful and malevolent into what's good. And that human beings actually do participate in that. And that that's part of the reason that our ancient tradition insists that we're made in the image of God. And I think that it's a mistake to underestimate the importance of that. Because I don't think that you can live life, a life of sufficient profundity to protect yourself from being corrupted by suffering and malevolence without adopting a responsibility that's commensurate with that set of ideas. I think that you either orient yourself upward, you know, to the star above the horizon and try desperately to improve the structure of being, or you work at counter purposes to it and make things worse. I don't think there's a middle ground. I, in fact, to the degree there is a middle ground, it tilts towards the negative because people who try to occupy the middle ground um, try to generally try to accrue the benefit, let's say, without adopting any of the risk. And that's not acceptable, not helpful. So that's a soul to me. About the soul, Carl Jung said, I have been compelled in my investigations into the structure of the unconscious to make a conceptual distinction between soul and psyche. By psyche, I understand the totality of all psychic processes, conscious as well as unconscious. By soul, on the other hand, I understand a clearly demarcated functional complex that can best be described as a personality. This was his early definition of soul. Later on, it became more complex. He wrote, the soul which accrues to ego consciousness during the opus has a feminine character in the man and a masculine character in a woman. His anima wants to reconcile and unite. Her animus tries to discern and discriminate. Carl Jung also introduced to us the concept of the soul image. About this, he writes, the representation in dreams or other products of the unconscious of the inner 
personality, usually contrasexual. See also anima and animus. Wherever an impassioned, almost magical relationship exists between the sexes, it is invariably a question of a projected soul image. Since these relationships are very common, the soul must be unconscious just as frequently. The soul image is a specific archetypal image produced by the unconscious, commonly experienced in projection onto a person of the opposite sex. For an idealistic woman, a depraved man is often the bearer of the soul image, hence the savior fantasy, so frequent in such cases. The same thing happens with men when the prostitute is surrounded with the halo of a soul crying for succor, or help, in other words. Many relationships begin and initially thrive on the basis of projected soul images. Inherently symbiotic, they often end badly. You speak about the concept of the soul. Um, do you associate this with any psychological constructs? Not any psychological constructs that are more valid than the notion of the soul. You know, there's, there's, I would say, what we mean by soul is something like animating spirit. And you might say, well, what's a spirit? And, well, that's actually rather easy to answer. So when a child of four is playing house, let's say when a child of four is playing house, she acts out the role of the mother. But acting out, that's a strange thing, right? Because she doesn't literally duplicate in her actions or her perceptions in the game what she observed her mother literally doing. So, for example, she didn't go into her mother's bedroom when her mother awoke and watched her turn her head in a particular way to awaken and count the number of blinks so that she could mimic that in her play. And, you know, you think that's absurd, but it's not absurd if it's just mimicry. It's not. It's unbelievably sophisticated. So what the girl does is she watches her mother manifest maternal behavior across a vast array of instances and she integrates that with the image of the mother she's received from all the books she's been read and all the little movies she's watched, the Disney movies and so forth, and she abstracts out the animating principle of the maternal and then she embodies that in play and usually with a little boy and that's practice for what's going to come later. It's unbelievably sophisticated and she's embodying a spirit and the spirit there is the abstraction of the central animating principle from multiple embodiments of its manifestation. And if you think children can't do that, well, then you don't know anything about children because they do that all the time in their pretend play, which is a necessary precursor to healthy psychological development. And so part of what we refer to as the soul is the presence of that spirit, or maybe even the capacity of embodying such spirits. And it's very difficult to know how deep that goes. You know, I had a vision at one point of all the men in my life who've been particularly influential in a benevolent way. You know, and so, and you think, well, just the mere notion of the idea that there could be a benevolent way that would unite the acts of benevolence across a series of men, that's all comprehensible to you. That's, you take that as a matter of course when you say that there are such things as good men, and you can identify them, right? Something stable about whatever is good across multiple manifestations of, of incarnation, let's say. And I saw that transform into the, the father person of the Trinity as the embodiment of that benevolent spirit. Now, I don't have any idea what that means metaphysically, because who does? But, but that that spirit manifesting itself within is certainly part of what we refer to when we talk about the soul. And you can see that shine through people. I mean, it's part of what gives someone charisma. It's part of what elicits the instinct to imitate in you. You know, when you see that even in simple things, when you see a remarkable athlete do something incredibly athletic to put the goal, to put the soccer ball, the football ball through the net, to score the goal and everybody leaps to their feet in celebration of that, well, that's, that's a celebration of the divine capacity to hit the target dead on. And it grips you at such a, lo a low level, way down inside your soul, that you're compelled to your feet to cheer, and you don't even know what you're doing. But you enjoy it, that's for sure, and that enjoyment is also a sign of the depth and utility of that response. You see this in all, all the things that people do that are you know, so-called 
popular entertainment. It's unbelievably sophisticated. The soul is participating in that in the fullest extent. And, you know, you can say, well, there's no use for the religious, there's no necessary use for the religious terminology. It's like, well, until you come up with a better word, there's plenty of use for it because it's a very complex and deep phenomena. And to, you know, just cast it into the realm of superstition in some casual manner is, it's just not helpful. Not in any possible, it's not helpful scientifically, it's not helpful ethically, it's not helpful existentially. Try treating someone for a while as if they don't have a soul. Just really, I mean it, just, you know, treat them like a deterministic machine, if that's your belief. Really act it out. You'll be like the most hated person in town in about 15 <laughs> minutes. Well, I mean, what do you make of practical evidence like that? I mean, you interact with people as if they're free souls capable of choosing between good and evil. That's what you do all the time. And maybe you can addle yourself out of that by some ridiculous rationalist ideology, but that just means you're kind of a gabbling fool and it's just going to make you trip over things you don't even notice in all of your social interactions. And you tell me, I don't care how you think philosophically or ideologically, you bloody well know that what I just said is true. So, and that's true even when you're interacting with an infant or a small child. It's true when you're dealing with someone who's elderly and, and virtually incapacitated in every way. You still see that divine spark, for lack of a better term, and we do lack a better term, by the way. You see that everywhere if your eyes are open and if you're willing to see it, and to the degree that you're responsive to that, then your actions are guided by love and your words are guided by truth. In his treatise On the Soul, Aristotle tells us that the soul is the form or essence of any living thing. It's not a distinct substance from the body that it's in. It's the possession of a soul of a specific kind which makes the organism an organism. A body without a soul or a soul in the wrong kind of body is impossible. He claims that some parts of the soul, like the intellect, for example, can exist without the body, but most parts cannot. About the soul, he says, We must no more ask whether the soul and body are one than ask whether the wax and the figure impressed on it are one. He also says that happiness is a quality of the soul, not a function of one's material circumstances. Here's another interesting one. Music directly represents the passions of the soul. If one listens to the wrong kind of music, he will become the wrong kind of person. And last but not least, the beauty of the soul shines out when a man bears with composure one heavy mischance after another, not because he does not feel them, but because he is a man of high and heroic temper. All right, that's all I have for this one. I will see you in the next one. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe. It helps support the channel a lot and goes a long way. That's it. Talk to you later.